Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I look, um, as I said, some of my slides have very small print, but uh, all of the tools that I mentioned are available online, so you can go to them and follow along if you wish. Um, talk today about the Neuroscience Information Framework, or NIF, as we call it, and I will be calling it. And essentially what NIF is is a neuroscience-centered portal for searching and accessing diverse resources that are available through the web. But as Peter indicated, this NIF project is really an outgrowth of a recognized need in biomedical science, which is now that you can get ready access to all the information in the world, what do you do with it? How do you actually find the things that you're looking for? And it's an increasing problem, and there are more and more and more projects like NIF that are being launched. We've actually been at this for a few years, as I'll show you a little bit in the history, and we've learned a few things along the way. So um, in my talk, I'll not only demonstrate and talk a little bit about what we've done in NIF, but also provide some perspectives on where the real challenges are uh, that I hope will be uh, you know, worthwhile to hear. Uh, before I start, I always like to acknowledge all of the people that are involved in this. The NIF is actually uh, led by UCSD, but involves several other universities, Yale University, Caltech, George Mason, Washington University, and many people that you may know here, Amarnath Gupta, for example, at SDSC, and, and, and others that people here may work with and are, are associated with uh, NBCR. But you can see we're a rather uh, large team. So basically, what is the NIF and what does it do? I'll start off with that. Uh, in its simplest form, the NIF is, uh, is a portal. It's an online uh, presence for finding and using neuroscience resources. And what are we, what are we talking about with a, 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 by a resource? I'll go into that in just a moment. But basically, they're the tools that scientists need, the data that scientists need, that are out there all the time, uh, that there are new ones are being added to all the time. It also, though, is really trying to provide a consistent framework for being able to describe these resources so that people who are creating new tools, they're making new data, aren't doing it just according to whatever specification they happen to think about at the time, but really sort of thinking about the fact that these things are all now interconnected and readily accessible and need to be brought together. So we need a, a standards and ways of doing that. It uh, provides simultaneous search over multiple types of information that are organized by various categories. As you'll see, we've spent a lot of time developing uh, ontologies and knowledge models that allow these things to happen so that we can actually find the information that we need. And uh, as much as possible, we utilize uh, existing tools, but we also try to use advanced technologies. Basically, you know, we know that Google searches the world, Bing searches the world. What is it that we need to do to enhance this for neuroscience? And a lot of the things that we do are not particularly uh, accessed well by search engines. This is the so-called hidden web problem, usually things that are inside of dynamic resources. So essentially, NIF does a lot of different things. And why is it necessary? I mean, basically, where is it that I find the things that I need? What do I go to the web to find? I go there to find data, software tools, materials, services. I want to get an antibody produced. I want a transgenic animal produced. I want data stored. I need training in something. I'd like to find a job. I'd like to find funding opportunities. So this is what we really are defining very broadly as a resource. It's basically anything that somebody needs to do their job or to do something in particular. And where is this information? Well, as we know, it's scattered across many different information sources. There's websites, there are databases, there are catalogs, some of which are just PDF files, or some of them are online. There's the literature. There are supplementary materials that are published as part of journal articles that are often in different places than the articles themselves. There are information portals that people have variously put together. And as we know, there's lots and lots and lots of these. So uh, as I'll, I'll show again and again in, in some of our initial uh, estimates of how many databases there are out there that are useful for neuroscience, we come up between two and 3,000 of them. Well, nobody's going to two or 3,000 different databases uh, by themselves. There's a lot of information there, and it's scattered. And we all know we spend an increasing amount of our time during the day sitting there browsing, searching, you know, surfing, and what have you, because we're always finding new things. So why is it that neuroscience found this problem to be particularly uh, difficult? I mean, we know it's difficult in general, but essentially I like to use this picture, which we, view, we created back in 1998 to illustrate the different ways that we image the nervous system in our imaging center that Peter uh, mentioned, but I use it for all the different problems that actually confront neuroscience. So uh, first of all, if we look at the Society for Neuroscience, which is the major organization that hosts neuroscientists, you see that there are about 35,000 different members, and 
they span all different disciplines, neurobiology, anatomy, psychology, physiology, pharmacology, chemistry, behavior, computational science, clinical science. And so it's a very, very diverse group of people, and they work across all these different scales. I mean, unlike uh, certain organs or in other systems where if you're dealing with genomics, uh, we don't know where the information is that we need in neuroscience. We don't even know where half the problems are. I mean, we just basically work in everything using multiple organisms. And so if you look at something like this, you see that there are groups of people who work at the level of whole brain who probably know very little about the complexes that sit in the brain. And there are people who work on cells who probably don't know all that much about how all these cells are put together. We are a very diverse group of people. And the other problem is, is that we don't really have any unifying data type or anything else. We don't work on one species. We don't work at one level. We don't just deal with sequences. We don't deal with protein molecular structures. We deal with all of these. And so one day I was looking at this and really trying to sort of uh, encapsulate what is the data integration problem in neuroscience. Well, you can see it right here. Is I made this lovely picture back in 1998, and I have a human, and I have a brain, and I have a slice of brain, and I have a cell, and I've got molecules. And I got these nice arrows that go between them. And so to me, as a neuroscientist, if I was talking to my colleagues, I'd say, oh, yes, there's a brain, and this is a slice of brain, and this is part of the brain that's been stained, and this is a cell that comes part of it. But we know that to a computer, this is largely incomprehensible. There is no obligatory relationship between this thing here and this thing here. There's no feature you can go by. There's nothing you can go by that says that this molecule here exists in some brain region here. And also these arrows, these arrows, what do they mean? Well, in fact, we know that these mean part of. You also look at the data types that we deal with. That's a word that I've learned as a practicing neuroscientist now dealing with these things, is that these are 3D volumes, 2D images, surface meshes, tree structures, ball and stick models, little squiggly line things. I know they have a name. And so basically, you know, to a computer, these are all different things. To me, they're biological objects, and I understand how they relate together. And if I'm talking to somebody in my lab, that's the language that I'm talking about. So you can see that we don't rally around data types. We don't rally around uh, you know, techniques. We don't rally around anything. The only thing that ties us together is a sort of an understanding of the way the biological system works, in our case, the nervous system. So we really have this problem where we have data, we have people, we have information systems, and they're going to need to be able to talk to one another. There's a very large human element in this. And again, the relationships amongst these things are not inherent in the data types themselves. So if we look at the history of the NIF, it was actually an outgrowth of activities that occurred for the Neuroinformatics Committee that's in the Society for Neuroscience, of which I took over the, the lead of that a couple of uh, this, this past year. And it was saying, you know what, all these databases have been created. There was a big push in funding in the NIH to make databases for neuroscience. We need them, just like the genomics databases, just like the protein data bank. We need to have all these databases. So they funded all of these. And somebody said, but you know, we don't actually know what we funded. You know, if you look at the neural institutes at the National Institute of Health, there are 16 of them that deal with uh, neuroscience-related issues. Somebody over here may have funded one. Somebody over here may have funded one. Nobody actually knew because there was no good way of finding it out. So they said, well, at the very least, we need to have a catalog. We need to have a catalog and a gateway so that you can go a portal and says, well, I'm looking for mice. I'm looking for hippocampus. Let me search across it, and we'll have a list of all of these uh, databases ready. Um, and that project uh, was underway about four or five years ago, and it currently exists. The other thing that people often said, though, is, well, why can't I just have a Google for neuroscience, that is? You know, why is it that, first of all, we need any new sort of search strategies? How come I can't just use Google? But then every time they use Google, they're like, how come Google doesn't work particularly well for neuroscience? Well, Google has a different purpose. And uh, what they mean, though, I've come to realize, is they want it to be easy. There's a perception that the search problem has been solved just because you can go and search a keyword and get all of these marvelous things, not realizing how many billions of dollars went into that and how much effort went into developing that. So the institute directors thought, well, we should just make one of these, and it'll be really, really easy to do. It's also comprehensive, and it's also pervasive. That is, everybody knows that you go to it and you use it all the time. Um, so. Initially, this project was funded, as so many things in NIH was, as a, this actually was funded as a contract. And it was led by members of the Neuroinformatics Committee, led by Dan Gardner at Cornell University. And the first job was to just essentially continue along these lines. How many resources are out there? That is, what have we paid for? How many are out there? And 
we went ahead and we sat there and we used Google and we listened to our colleagues and we did all these things and we identified several hundred resources and Dan concluded, well, we've identified 400 in the first year, so there must be about X number. There must be about maybe 500. Well, of course, that was wrong. Uh, you know, we, every day we keep finding new ones and this is my argument to institute directors and otherwise. I said, we sit there with Google every day and look for resources and every day we go to a neuroscience convention and find out somebody else has developed a tool that we didn't know about because, you know, you just don't know about it. You don't know what's out there in those billions and billions of pages. They then said, you should design a system and tell us what we should do about it. And if we like it, we'll pay for it. So essentially, uh, a group that was largely led by UCSD said, OK, well, here's some of the things that we could do that might help us try to find these things a little bit better. And uh, NIH said, OK, that's good enough. And they rewarded another contract, this time passing to UCSD, to say, OK, now you should build this system. You should build this system and put it in place. So essentially, they said, you go find out what's there, and you go feel out, you know, find out how to deal with it, and then we'll see if we like it or not. So essentially, the premise of the NIF is how do we provide a consistent and easy to implement framework for those who are providing resources and those who are looking for resources. And we, again, are trying to balance the fact that there are humans trying to do this and that there's also machine access, machine understandability that needs to be addressed here. So here's just a demonstration of the NIF, the current NIF portal. And what somebody's doing up here is they're typing in the word hippocampus just in a very simple search box. And they're saying, let me go ahead and search. And the NIF system consults a little knowledge base that it has, its vocabularies, to say, well, what do I know about other things that the hippocampus might be called? And then it provides information in different ways. And so what you saw there was something called NIF web, which I'll go through. It's also going through the, neuros the, the NIF registry, essentially that database of resources that we said were important. And you know they have little descriptions, and there's keywords uh, descriptors. Uh, it'll take you to a page that describes it, or it'll take you right to the page in the, the home page of that resource uh, on the web. But over here is the Data Federation tab. And this is a Data Federation tab. This is actually databases who have linked their schemas to the NIF so that we can directly query them. That's one of the things that people wanted to say, well, I don't just want to learn about which resources might have information. I want to know which resources have information. So we have about 24 of these, and they're categorized. And when you, click, when you search on them, it brings up a table from that particular database. And you can see a snapshot of information. So in this case, hippocampus, this is telling us atlases and things. And then if you go and click on a link, it will actually take you to that record in that data source. So it doesn't tell you, take you to the home page and say this might have information about hippocampus. It's saying this is the page that actually has information about hippocampus. This is the answer to your query. Uh, we also maintain a literature service. And so we have PubMed, and we allow you to search PubMed. And we also have other literature uh, tools that provide different rankings and different views. So essentially, the current NIF portal provides information in multiple forms. We don't know where it is the thing you want is is going to be, so we try to provide it as many way, different ways as possible. We make use of existing tools like PubMed, but we also provide customizations on top of that that may be more tuned to neuroscience, because that's what we can do. So we provide views of the web, we provide views of literature that are ranked more according to the ways that neuroscience would do it, rather than as sort of generic different ways that everybody might do it. So during this uh, time, during phase one and two, and, and, and now phase three, we developed certain guiding principles of the way that NIF had to work. And first and foremost, even though NIH invested a lot of money in it, it's nowhere near the capitalization that you would get for a company, even a small, tiny company. You know, it's, a, it's essentially funded by a grant. So we had, to use very, we had to build very heavily on existing technologies. And again, we've said NIH invested in these technologies already. We may as well use them. So we used a lot of technologies from projects that we were involved in and other open source tools uh, like the Burn. The other thing we had to appreciate is that information resources come in many sizes and flavors. And so those projects that say you have to create a, you know, a, a resource like this, you have to use this database, or you have to use this, a lot, you know, this, this language, and you have to have this type of interface, are not going to work. Because everybody has their own resource. They have their own purpose for creating it. They have their own budgetary constraints. They have their own IT constraints. They have a lot of different uh, reasons why they decided to put something on the web. And so essentially, we say that the framework has to work with resources as they are, not necessarily as we wish them to be. 
And it's never going to be a case where one size is going to fit all. These things have different purposes. So we largely are a federated system. That is, we maintain indexes and things, but we don't maintain the resources. These are independently developed and independently maintained. And we recognize that they're developed for their own purpose, and we have to respect that. Uh, Again, no single strategy will work with the current diversity of neuroscience resources. So we're not trying to re-engineer the world all at once. We're trying to do it slowly. Yes, Phil? What happens when a resource goes away that you don't control? Basically, it goes away. <laughs> and, and it's just not there anymore. We don't That's query it. So yeah. um, have you guys had to deal with dangling references? In, in oh, yes, and we will get to that. I mean, it's uh, some of our interoperability best practices and things. <laughs> but I mean, we can't, and, and I've told our program officer again and again, we cannot fix that problem because you don't want us to maintain huge, gigantic data banks. And so you, know, you can have it one way, you can have it the other way. We can't solve all of those problems. Um, so we're trying to design the framework so it'll be as broadly as applicable as possible to those who are also trying to develop technologies. That means we can make some recommendations, we can have some things, but we can't constrain what everybody is going to do, and we don't want to either. Uh, we also view this, though, that even though that this is for neuroscience, we are not building this just for neuroscientists. Neuroscience is part of larger biomedical science. It's very difficult to draw a wall and say this is neuroscience and this is cardiology and this is uh, environmental science. We know that this is a broader ecosystem and we want to make sure that we're interoperable. And again, we have to take advantage of emerging conven conventions. There are ways that people are used to using tools, and this is the way they like to use them. And if we tell them, no, I'm sorry, this is better, it's still not going to work because they're going to use them the way that they want to use them. And those are largely growing up around social networking sites, search engines, and other sorts of things. So one of the first things we did in NIF, and it's been lost to history as to where these, this nomenclature came from, but essentially we said, OK, there's multiple things. If you have a resource, there's multiple ways we can make it it available. At the very simplest thing, we can say it's a level one resource. And a level one resource essentially would be encapsulated by the NIF registry. You tell me, Marianne, I have a software tool. Here's where you can find the software tool. This is what the software tool does, and I'm the contact person. OK, it's a very simple catalog. So this is you know, an online tool. We go ahead and do this. We have curators who actively go out and try to find these. But people can come and nominate their own resource. It doesn't matter. And we've developed a vocabulary for describing what these are, because it helps to have a controlled vocabulary if you're looking for software databases and so on and so forth. But it was very apparent in the first round of NIF and also in the Neuroscience Database Gateway that this level of characterization is not sufficient for actually finding most things. And I will show you that and go, come back to this theme a little bit later, because this is really one of the very, very hard things to do. Resources are very complicated entities. It's not that easy to slap labels on them that will be comprehensive enough that people will find it. So essentially, we knew we needed to have access to deeper content. You already saw that we have the ability to take databases and go directly into the databases, and that's very, very important. But of course, there's a lot of things that aren't databases. They don't have a programmatic API. They don't have a schema. What do you do with those? And so we had this whole sort of middle mushy level, which we called level two, which says, well, we need to provide deeper access to it. But we also know that it's not quite at this level of integration. It's, it's a little bit something in between. And during the past year, we've gone very far in actually defining what this level two is and what we use it for. And I will show that in just a moment. So this just shows, again, the NIF registry. It's human curated. It's nominated by self, by others. Uh, mostly non-commercial sites. But if the community wants commercial sites, we'll be happy to put in there. We generally pick things that are neuroscience relevant, but that's in quotations because, again, what relevancy is is very open-ended. We're not really sure. And, as, and we have a list of about two to 3,000. We currently have about 1,900 that are exposed, and we've got another uh, 1,000 or so that we're working through and trying to figure out how to characterize them. So this in and it's, you know, it's categorized by uh, type, and you can sort it. You can look at it. Yes, Phil? With 59 pages, does anybody ever look at all of those? Or do no. They, yeah, they need another way to. They yeah, so they need care. filters, they need everything else. You know, that's why we have the, the controlled vocabulary and browsing and other things. Okay? Um, so here's our consistent resource vocabulary. Now, when NIF started, they said, okay, we're going to make this consistent resource vocabulary. It turns out that there were about two or three other groups who were also making resource uh, vocabularies. And NIF's basic premise is. There are certain things in life you can fight about. There are certain things that are it's not worth fighting about. And having this being done consistently would give us a lot of advantage. So we've come together with these different groups. There's processes of negotiation that are going on. But we said we should just come up with a biomedical resource description, 
hierarchy and you know, a set of classes. And we've actually made some success in, in, in moving forward jointly, saying it doesn't make sense to maintain 10 different definitions of website. We'll leave that for 10 different definitions of hippocampus. So we do have this descriptor. And it's an ongoing thing. And it's not the easiest thing in the world. But we, you know, we, we've made some progress. But as I said, the central problem with this level, this, this, this level, this level one, is that even though this was the original conception of what NIF would be, the resources are way too complex to, to, to characterize. It's, you know, if it's 95% on the heart, but it's got one brain image there, do you slap brain on it? What do you do? So it was way too difficult for us to actually characterize all the content. So we said, well, what is it that we should do? We said, it, you know, what we're going to do as human annotators is basically annotate things that are either A, obvious, if it's a mouse database, we put mouse on there, or B, not obvious but necessary. So if a resource doesn't describe itself as having green fluorescent protein, but all of its data on green fluorescent protein in there somehow, we're going to put that term in there because then it's easy for us to find it. Okay. Um, we've also done a lot of work in trying to define what a resource is. If you look at something like the Allen Brain Atlas, this very big, big sophisticated collection of data. It's an atlas, it's algorithms, it's software tool, it's data. What is it that you call it? I mean, who the heck knows? So one of the very first things we did to try to solve this problem was create what we called NIF Web. And NIF Web essentially uses the neuroscience registry. It says, well, you've already gone through and told us these sites are relevant for neuroscience. Let's go make a web index using some of the open source web tools that are based on those sites and the sites that those things link to. Okay? So how does that help us? Well, essentially, it's targeted. It's not human curated, because we do do a crawl. But if you search Google, for example, for knockouts, you get knockouts of punching, and you get knockouts for uh, software and what have you. But if you search NIF Web, which obviously has a lot less content, but a lot more focused, you get transgenic knockout mice, transgenic mice projects, yeast knockouts, other knockouts. So we've shown that for certain types of things, specifically for things that may share terms with a broad popular domain, having a focused web search is actually a lot more effective okay, than, than being able to go to something like Google. So this, again, was something that built off the NIF registry and was useful to have the NIF registry for that, even though, again, as Phil indicated, you know, how, how much content can you go through in something like that? But you can build other tools with them. Level three, I already went over in the sense that these are databases. They have a programmatic API. They have a schema. They go ahead, they register their schema with the NIF, and they generate views that uh, we can actually query. So, works very well. As I said, we have 24 of these that are currently online with millions and millions and millions of records. It's a very, very rich source of information. Um, they, ex they choose the views that they wish to expose. So if there's private data, they don't make it available. They only make available what we, what we want. But essentially, instead of you having to go and issue these queries independently to all these databases, you query them all simultaneously. The level two is where we've put a lot of, of uh, effort in the last year. And the level two is actually breaking up into two different pieces to handle two problems that we know are, are significant. One is the problem of updating. If you have a human curated catalog, uh, and we did that in NIF phase one, we went through, we characterized all of these. And by the time we checked the links starting the following year, half the links were broken. The contact person changed. The phone numbers have changed. All this stuff have changed. So it's obvious that even though we can go and identify these, if we have to be responsible for all the updates. It's never going to work, and you're going to get out of date very, very quickly. So there were several groups, including some of the collaborators that, uh, in the NIF project, that had been playing with developing these little XML files. Essentially, you post a resource description on your website. You update that description. NIF has a crawler. It goes and says, oh, this site has updated itself. We'll go ahead and that information in our catalog. So these tools, uh, they call them DISCO for discovery because it allows these resources to become discoverable and updated. And we're working with several groups who are trying to do something similar. Again, it's you know, the person who's developing the resource needs to keep it up to date, but at least we don't have to go out and visit 2,000 resources every day and try to determine whether anything has changed. You're going to have to have something like that. Um, secondly, though, we're also using this level two for some of this deeper integration, because you can see the level three tools work very nicely if you have a database and an API that the, that the mediator can query. But when we go through and we look at different websites, we see, in fact, that there's a lot of resources that are out there that are highly structured. You know, somebody's gone through and made these very nice tables on the web. They put these very nice tables inside of PDFs. But they're not queryable. 
So we actually can use some of the DISCO tools, the level two tools, to turn these things into something that we can query. We can turn them into something that's semi-structured and essentially expose them like they are a database. So for example, one of the things that we did this with was something called Drug Bank. Drug Bank is a very nice uh, set of web pages, but it requires you to sort of traverse through different links and what have you to, to expose all the information. Very easy for a human, not so easy for a computer. Um, this shows you the drug bank interface. Again, everything is very, very nicely structured. It's just not inherently queryable. Using the DISCO protocol, we turn that into something that we can query, and then it gets exposed through the NIF Data Federation interface. And so your querying is as if it was a database. When you go and click on a link, you go back to that page. So this actually has turned out to be a very, very useful set because there's a lot of resources that fall into this category. It allows NIF to add value on top of these, make them queryable, again, without the users there having to do a whole lot of re-engineering and put a database back end in. So NIF, once we get all these resources together, we have to really deal with this very difficult problem is, okay, once you can find all the information in the world, what is it that you do? So the data integration problem, and the data integration problem actually has multiple different levels. Um, right now, again, NIF has many, many different records. You can see for this query, you return 104,000 different records. So it needs to be organized in some way or you're not going to find it. So one of the things that NIF did, again, with its human curators using the NIF registry is said, well, we're going to put these into different data types. And these data types are sort of neuroscience-centered data types. They're not sort of what's meant by a computer. It said, well, it can be a grant, it can be connectivity information, brain activation foci, antibodies, or what have you. But we've got that characterization in the NIF registry. And those results are organized according to data type. They're also organized according to nervous system level. They mostly deal with genes. Do they deal with networks? What do they deal with? And these are dynamically generated. And it tells you what different um, resources are available in each one of these. The second problem that we had was we realized that even though this was marvelous that you could place people right smack in the middle of one of these complicated resources, if you went right to that resource page, so you went to the SUMSDB, which is the brain activation foci, right at the response for your query, you really don't know what, you, what to do next because you've lost the context. You'd have to go back to the home page, try to figure out why they created this thing so that you could figure out where to go next. So it was a very simple and practical solution. Essentially, NIF said, look, all of you who are making your data available through this, put a tutorial that tells you what to do when you get there from NIF. So it takes you from a NIF query, says once you're here, this is the things that you, these are the things you can do and here's how you go ahead and do it. We know that that's not perfect, but again, it's a practical solution right now that at least allows people to, to uh, be able to use the information that they return. This is just showing how you would map uh, brain activation foci on a brain using some of those tools. One of the things that we're most excited about, and of course really gets down to the issue of data integration, is what we're calling horizontal integration. So you saw the navigation scheme that we had for NIF. It essentially said, well, I've got 24 databases, and I can characterize these according to these different axes, and now I can go and click on each one and go through it. But we also know as neuroscientists that a lot of these resources are covering similar things. And if you ask neuroscientists, what are some of the questions you want to ask? Why are you bothering to make the Allen Brain Atlas or the GenSat database? It's like, well, I'm trying to find out what genes are expressed in what brain area. So again, we customize our search interface. For example, just like in Google, you can put uh, define and colon and get something after it. You can do that here with genes, because we care about genes. And if you follow it by a brain region, we said we can take all of the sources that give us brain region and gene, and we can put them all together in the same view so that you can see them all at once. So this is actually a table returning uh, GRM in the cerebral cortex, and you see that the Allen Brain Atlas GenSat and the Mouse Genome Database all have information on it, and we've sort of uh, structured it, and again, in a coherent view. Now, this is largely done by humans, but again, you know, NIF says we have to deliver something practical, and as we'll see, one of the, the lessons we've learned is that humans are still very much required. Okay, so this actually brings us, I think, into something that's incredibly useful, but also now starts to reveal all of the problems that we know we're going to have with data integration. So if I ask that question from those three resources, is GRM1 in cerebral cortex, I can go ahead and I can pick out results from the Allen Brain Atlas, who says expression level is 23, GenSat says weak signal, and MGD says true. Well, you can also see that these are by three different techniques. But you say, well, what does 23 mean? It turns out 23 has no meaning whatsoever outside of the Allen Brain Atlas, because they've normalized it to their own um, 
expression levels. It has, there are no national norms for figuring out what this means. And you can make no conclusion whatsoever about 23 being present or not present because it's all normalized to the sort of the most intense signal to the lowest signal. And so there's no absolute meaning to 23. How would you know that? Well, you had to actually dig through the web pages of Allen, call them on the phone, and do a lot of legwork to figure that out. There was nothing that was exposed on the site. There was no way for you to know that. So we can't go in and say, it's there. Weak signal. You'd say, OK, well, that's pretty obvious. It's a weak signal. Only it turns out the way GenSat makes their uh, gene expression patterns is that they tie the promoter to a gene to GFP. And so a weak signal just means maybe you only have a few GFPs. It may mean nothing whatsoever about whether the gene is there or not. It just means this may be what our construct is. So again, how do you know that? You call, you read the papers, you go, and you, and you do this sort of human legwork. Um, so the NIF system will allow this information to come to you. But one of the things is that because there are a lack of standards in data annotation, that it's a lot of human investment in trying to reconcile information and figure all this out. And that's where we spend most of our time actually trying to do this. So for example, if you go to these different sources and try to figure out whether they even use the term cerebral cortex in the same way, whether they're the same substructures. Some of them will tell you what substructures are there. Some of them won't even tell you what substructures are there. So you actually have no good way of comparing this. So there is this sort of need for sort of explicitness and standards and what to do in order to annotate data so that we can use these information systems a little bit more effectively. Um, so one of the big areas that NIF has worked on is to try to develop these these standards, vocabularies, ontologies, terminologies, all of these different things. And one of the things that we're working on the most is to provide definitions of them. You know, we don't really care what people call it as long as we know that you mean the same thing. Cerebral cortex is cerebral cortex if the underlying definition is the same, whether I call it CC or I call it one or I do anything else. But there is no place where these definitions are out there. There are no places where one can go to kind of get this. Um, so they need to be readily accessible and easy to understand. There are loads of people who say that researchers will not use common terminologies. But when you actually go and look deep down, you find out that for data providers, they really don't care what the definition of cerebral cortex is. They just want to know what it is so that they can apply it. The GenSat people are molecular biologists. They are not anatomists. It's the anatomists who care about it. So in fact, there is some hope that if one had a place where you could go for these definitions, that at least people would use them in order to annotate their data. And we've heard this over and over again. Just tell me what to call it. I'll call it that. But they don't have any place to go. So NIF has spent a lot of time developing these types of vocabularies. And again, recognizing that we need to go between sort of a human-centered view and a machine-centered view, we actually maintain vocabularies in multiple different forms. In the human-centered view, we'd like to know how, you, how neuroscientists search for their data. If it's a synonym that they use, if it's a, if it's a term that they use, we want to make sure that we have that and that that maps to a concept. But for a machine, it needs a little bit more formal semantics. And so we're also working on building ontologies using OWL and some of the, the um, uh, conventions that are coming about in order to do this. But again, because we know that we need to interface with the larger life science community, there's been a lot of work in, in open biological ontologies and others in trying to come up with ontologies for neuroscience or for science in general, or biology in general. So wherever is possible, NIF tries to actually use these, keep the unique identifiers, and make sure that we can uh, interface so that it doesn't matter whether you're working in NIF space or in gene space, you're using the same set of identifiers so that we can start to bring these things together. So essentially, our two vocabularies are what we call NIF basic and also the NIF standard, where we've done a lot more knowledge engineering to try to make this into something that's computable. We tried to build them in a, in a modular fashion. Um, that means that we have essentially different modules that each cover a major branch or level in the, in the nervous system. Wherever possible, as he said, if there was an existing terminology, we imported it in, or an ontology, we imported it in, and we retained its identifiers. And we now have about 17 or 18,000 of these different uh, concepts done by going out, seeing what the community has done, and if there's nothing there, developing it ourselves. 
But this has been a real balancing act. There's different schools of thought as to how to build these. There's different purposes, again, to which they are maintained. So we have tried, again, to, to come up with a system that allows us to try to navigate amongst these very difficult waters while getting our work done. So essentially, we keep in mind that NIF is for humans and, and machines. And the more formal you make an ontology, the less comprehensible it is to a human. They don't know what you're talking about. So you need to be able to go back and forth. Our primary concern is annotating data and not so much in being able to infer the periodic table right now from an you know, ontology of the elements. We have to meet the teams of the community, and we have a budget. You know, so there's only so much effort we can put into all of this. But we've sort of laid out a strategy, and I don't have time to go into it now, that allows us to evolve from these sort of less formal to more formal uh, semantics. And one of the things that we have done is really say, you know, we have to start with the, ne the lexicon. We've created a set of classes. We have definitions for those classes. And over time, we're sort of building these things into deeper and deeper knowledge structures so that they can be used for more and more things. And this just shows um, our, our lexicon exposed through a wiki. So you see that there's a category, ALS, and it gives you the subcategories, it gives you the definition, gives you supporting metadata about this, what are the synonyms, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so how are we using the ontology in NIF? Again, we're being very flexible about this. Sometimes we use it as a controlled vocabulary for describing resources, you know, databases, images, Parkinson's disease. We also are doing some entity mapping of database and database content, and I'll show you that in just a moment. And we're using it in search. As you saw in the demonstration, we use a mixture. Uh, we, we expand search out into synonyms and to related terms. And even though in the beginning of NIF, again, it was envisioned that we would use these very targeted, targeted uh, queries where you'd say, well, I want to search for database. I want to search for this. You know, it turns out that the amount of mapped content that you're going to have at any moment is so small that, in fact, you're not going to be able to search for anything. So the, the joke that we always used in the beginning was, you can search for anything you want as long as it's a Purkinje cell, because we had those well mapped, but you couldn't search for anything else. And that's not going to work in a search portal. People are going to want to search for whatever they want to search for. You cannot tell them what to search for. So the vocabularies are really designed to help us go again between the humans and these machines to allow us to uh, deal with this. So this just shows the query expansion that you saw, where I can use synonyms. I can also use part of relationships and other types of relationships to expand my search using a, a string-based method. Uh, you also can use this to do so-called entity mapping. That is, you go into a database. They use a custom abbreviation or a symbolic notation. We can go ahead and say, well, this actually maps onto our concept number 47. So therefore, when you search for our concept, even though that string doesn't appear, you can find it. So this is maintaining, again, um, uh, entity identification between two, two, two resources. We're also building more complicated relationships into our different modules so that you can search according to those. So for example, uh, we now have the relationship between molecules and neurons. So if you want to search for neurons that use a particular neurotransmitter, you can go ahead and search for those. And it generates a list of those and searches those against our, our data resources. We've also, recognizing that we need to go between humans and machines, done a lot to try to figure out how we can get the community involved. So we created something called the Neuralex Wiki, which you saw already. Essentially, we expose all of our information through a wiki using something called the Semantic Media Wiki. People can come and add content to it, browse it, comment on it, you know, try to, again, uh, get some community consensus about how these are used. We differentiate ourselves from Wikipedia, and that we really are a lexicon. We're focusing on the definitions of things rather than everything that's interesting about something, but really have found that this is removing the barriers that you normally have getting people like myself to contribute. So where are we going from here? I would say it's more everything. We're essentially at the end of the first year of a five-year contract. Uh, we're adding more content. We're adding more semantics. We're working on identity. So right now, if you have a resource that's at NIF Web, it's not necessarily known that that's the same resource that's in NIF registry. So we're working on trying to find uh, unique identifiers for these with the community. More tools, more education, essentially, in the sense that there we've learned a lot of things about how one goes about doing this in a very practical way. And it's our job to sort of try to expose these. So we've created blogs that say four simple things that you can do to make your database more interoperable. And I don't have time to go into all of my different musings, but one thing that I do want to just say is that there's no single approach, technology, philosophy, tool, or platform that we know of right now that solves everything. 
that developing resources that are interoperable is an act of will right now. And that what has not happened is that we still are sitting in our own local worlds and only thinking about building things for our use or maybe the people next to us. And is it necessary that we maybe think a little bit more broader? Um, an example that I give is that we get very angry when commercial providers don't make their products interoperable. I don't like it when I can't plug my cell phone into any adapter that I have to use this adapter. You hear neuroscientists complaining about microscope manufacturers at the same time they're like, oh, but I'm not going to do anything to make my data more understandable, more accessible. I don't think that's a good attitude. And again, you know, there's all these different arguments that are going on in the community. Do you need machine, human, top down, bottom up, ontology, terminology? My answer is you need all of that right now. <laughs> you, know, we, you, know, you need all of these technologies and all these technologies to work together. So this is my other repurposed slide that I use in addition to my brain levels. is my favorite Gary Larson cartoons, what we say to dogs. OK, Ginger, I've had it. You stay it out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, and what they hear. Blah, blah, Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, blah, blah. And I use this to say this is difficulties in interdisciplinary communication, but it also probably is the current state of our data integration abilities. We have a few little islands here that we can use to link, but there's a lot of stuff that we can't do yet. And the question that NIF has is how can we start to make this bubble and this bubble look a lot more similar? Thank you. <laughs>